Hey folks, have you ever wanted to get started in real estate photography? Well, sit tight because in this interview, we're gonna talk about how you can get started as a real estate photographer. This is Twit. All right, folks, so one of the, one of the kind of unknown parts of commercial photography or photography where you actually generate revenue is real estate photography. Rich Baum is a real estate photographer based in the Sacramento area. He does this every single day. He is a professional at it and has made some stunning images that that you probably would want made of your house. <laughs> Rich has has graciously, graciously donated his time today on this rainy Sacramento day to sit down and give us some, you know, one or two, maybe three really concise tips on how you can get started in real estate photography and actually maybe make a buck or two at it. Rich, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Well, thanks, Frederick. I'm a big fan of yours. Been watching or listening to your uh, podcast for years. And I appreciate you having me on. I mean, you're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, so you're the one that's been listening. Okay, I understand. <laughs> well, there's, there's three of us. There's three of you. That's why I get three hits. You you watch on your phone, your computer, I and then usually do it twice though. So I, I I try and help. I'm a helper. I yeah. love it. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming on, man. This is yeah. This is good. So before we dive in, I, I re I'm really excited about this because you know honestly, I I considered doing this type of photography, but have always shied away from it because of the reasons I'm going to like draw out of your brain during this conversation. <laughs> Basically, these questions. So yeah, yeah, a little bit. We'll we'll extract them surgically from your from your brain. Okay, so give me some background on you. Like, how, how did you get started in this line of work and, and what makes you want to hang out the shingle of real estate photographer? Well, I, I come from a background in the motion picture industry. It's funny because I, I only shoot still images now and I purposely don't like to do video, but uh, I did moving pictures uh, as a union prop master for 35 years in LA. I'm mm -hmm. in the local 44 union. And I eventually moved up, met my wife, moved up to Northern California. And uh, I was commuting back and forth for, gosh, for a couple of years. And when my kids started growing up, I said, I can't do this anymore. So I had to find a, a revenue source. And, and, you know, I tried a bunch of things and nothing was really sticking or nothing I enjoyed. Then I started to, uh, I got my first serious DSLR. I've been shooting photography since 1968, a long time. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah all over the world. And uh, I got my first uh, DSLR, I think it was a, a Nikon D80. And uh, I started shooting and then I started posting to Facebook and places and people replied with, your photos are amazing. Yeah. Well, don't ever listen to when people said they're amazing because they really were probably crappy. But yeah. I started really getting into it and I wanted to make a living. So I wanted to transition into it. So I started shooting everything I could shoot, er, learning everything about photography. I was shooting weddings. I was shooting s professional sports, running races, um, portraits, seniors, you name it. And then I started also always love shooting buildings and always yeah. love shooting architecture around the world and uh, working on movies in, in India. I, I did uh, just photography forever. That's and great. long story short, it's the one thing that kind of stuck. And the best part about it is, is I don't work weekends if I don't want to. I love all my clients. I'm really lucky. Uh, I don't have any uh, terrible uh, uh, realtors that I have to fire, although I fire one a year or if I, I have to. Yeah. But uh, I really have uh, found that the real estate photography and uh, rolling over into design photography, interiors photography, architectural and I use that lightly because that's its own genre. Yeah. But uh, the real estate has gone really well. And I, I now uh, I specialize in twilight photography for real estate. Um, I do um, lighting. I use lighting. So I do kind of high end um, real estate photography. And uh, 
it's it's just been great. So uh, it's been a wonderful re- wonderful revenue and so- income uh, resource. But it really is just I, I love the genre. I love it's very challenging. People ask me, well, it's just a house, uh, it's just a kitchen, and I right. said, well, you try and light that kitchen, and right. uh, they don't know what they don't know, as I always say. Yeah. So uh, when people learn, they they realize, uh, people, especially people like you, extremely talented photographers, that try it. Um, usually many times have less than desirable results. Yeah. And that's when they start seeking out help and, and then they get on the long road. So I think, I think you, you, you hit it right on the head, right? Because a lot of people think, yeah, well, I don't know, I'm not going to say a lot of people, but I would say, you know, the uninformed part of, of our masses may lump real estate photography in with with architectural photography, like you said, when these are two completely different disciplines, two completely different beasts. Can you just quickly go into what are the differences? Like, what are the main nuances between architectural photography and real estate photography? Um, there's so many differences and uh they're they're very very similar in some ways but very different in other ways a lot of the differences are the amount of time i'll spend on an architectural shoot or a a, a, let's just call it more design or interiors photography for builders for designers for products for you know things like that um i will spend the usually about four times the amount of time photographing a uh, a design shoot and then i will also spend four or more times uh, the amount of time editing so a lot oh, more wow. time is put into it and the returns on that time are not really equal to the amount of time put in i'm going to get a better product but it's not going to be unbelievably better but i will also choose the special times of day to do uh, really important shoots design mm-hmm. shoots mm-hmm. whereas real estate i've had to learn to make it work every single day at any time of day that's why i use lighting personally i teach lighting mm-hmm. um but like today i have to do a twilight shoot and a uh, a big big house um and it's pouring rain so i'll let you know how that one turns out but i've got to make that happen so I will I will figure it out. But the two are very different as far as pricing. Uh, Pricing is one of the most difficult things to even get into in in this type of photography. Much more for me, much more difficult than weddings or sports because those are more cut and dry. And that's Um, what I want to that's what I want to get into, Rich. So so the, the pricing aspect of it, there's really two like three three main I mean I know I'm oversimplifying this, but there's for me there's like three main things that that are question mark variables in my head on real estate photography one is what gear do you shoot with like what do you what do you need a tilt shift lens do you need a large format camera a medium format or can you deal with your phone or micro four thirds um secondly is uh, where do you find these clients like you mentioned earlier that uh, realtors, you know, are your your clients are realtors, but in my, that was an epiphany moment in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, of course, realtors. I would think that you'd go to the homeowner, and then the homeowner would hire you. But realtors, of course, they're the ones who have all the listings, right? And then thirdly is pricing, like you just you just alluded to, pricing is the scary nugget. Like, what do you choose for? What do you charge for this? And is it based on your time and how much how much time you've spent doing this? Is it by the hour? Is it by the house? Is it by the number of rooms? Is it square footage? All of these questions. So can you let's start with the first one, the gear question. When you go out, what do you shoot with? And what do you recommend people that you teach in your workshops that they shoot with when they when they attempt this kind of photography? Well, you made some really good points there, and it's all really important. And absolutely, the uh, pricing to me is the hardest. That's why I don't do a lot of pricing on my YouTube channel or, or what I'm teaching. But I do have to do some, so I've tried to come up with some ideas. But as far as gear, um, this is one thing about this genre is you don't need high ISO abilities. You don't need fantastic focus. You don't need – you can get by with my main real estate photography camera for day-to-day real estate is going to be my Sony a6000, which I think I got open box from, uh, from Best Buy for about $350. Oh, wow. It's a crop sensor camera. And the lens I use, the lens of choice is a Sam Yang 12 millimeter. And that is about $275. Uh, Oh, wow. That's why you don't need to have that. Now, uh, this works great because I'm shooting generally nothing higher than ISO 400. 
and I am manually focusing. That Samyang lens is the same as a Rokinon. It's uh, manually focusing, mm -hmm. but I prefer manually focusing because uh, I want to make sure it's always right. And sometimes when you're auto-focusing, you'll bracket and you'll get a wrong a wrong focus. So that won't uh, that won't fly. Um, the other cameras I use, though, for all of my um, real estate and uh, architectural and, and design photography is a Nikon D750, and I have a various uh, lenses that I use. Uh, I could use anywhere from a 70 to 200 for detail shots, mm -hmm. but my main uh, bread and butter lens when I used the zoom lens for my Nikon was my 16 to 35 F4, which is a nice all-around lens. It's a great lens. I've taken around the world shooting everything in, with it, and it's great, but now I've kind of gotten into, um, I've gotten into doing uh, tilt-shift lenses, uh, I have a 19 millimeter Nikon and a 24 millimeter Nikon. I can also put those on my crop sensor body uh, with a Metabones uh, speed booster adapter, which negates the crop factor, which is all technical. But bottom line is for real estate photography, you do not need to have a very expensive camera and lens. You do not need to have a tilt shift lens by any means. I can even do a thing called a fake tilt shift, which you can find a tutorial on my on my uh, YouTube channel. But um, they sure help. Uh, tilt shifts are great tools when you learn what they're all about. I recommend if you're thinking about it, just go rent one. It's well yeah. worth it because my Nikon was like 3,500 bucks, which is pretty expensive for a prime lens. Uh, but so can you can can stuff. can you? So tilt shift, just just for the folks that don't know what tilt shift lenses are, a tilt shift lens is a it's a lens that you can articulate and adjust the plane on both the the focal plane and the lens element plane and why and shift them so tilt like this and shift them like this so what that allows you to do is per is to correct for converging lines so if you take a wide angle lens like a 16 millimeter 15 millimeter or wider seven millimeter on micro four thirds and aim it up at a building those lines are going to converge or if you aim it down they're going to spread out right so it's just the way the optics Keystoning work keystoning effect yeah. keystoning right and with these lenses you can correct for that so which looks weird in a lot of ways because your brain isn't ready for it and it looks it looks good because your brain wants to see straight lines but it's it, you know these these expensive lenses allow you to fix that right so is it is so i guess the question is it's great to have one of those lenses if you can f afford it or rent it or whatever, but can you replicate that in Photoshop? Like, can you, you can correct for a perspective inside of Photoshop, right? Yeah, when you do a fake tilt shift, all you have to do, first of all, you have to move back further because when you correct for the keystoning effect, you're going to crop probably 20, 30% off the image. Yep. But all you have to do is put your, your camera up where you want. Like an example of when you want a tilt shift is you've got a beautiful window view of the ocean, but down at, at head height. At camera level, you can not you can only see the sky. So you want to bring your camera up really high or wherever you want it. And shifting, you would shift down. I only, in, in this genre, I only really do shifting. I don't tilt. I don't do the miniature effect or, or uh, infinite focus. I use it strictly to change my perspective. But real simply, it just, um, it has a larger, I, I'm not going to get into the technicals because I'm not the right guy for that. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it, force, it puts the image on a larger plane, a larger space, and then it can move up and down within that space. And um, you can have it up here. And instead of tilting down, you just shift down and it will bring you the same uh, perspective that you want, but you're still going to be able to see up where you were. You can also do reverse tilt shifts in a bathroom, put your camera down low and you shift up uh, where you don't see yourself in the mirror. There are a lot of tricks, yeah. but it is a wonderful tool. It also allows you to change the composition and change the amount of ceiling. Sometimes you put your camera up high, you see half the, half the shot is ceiling. So you can bring that down. It also helps you because now you have all this room to bounce your lights off the ceiling. We, we bounce lights, tend to bounce lights. Uh, it's very different lighting. Uh, than and I want to talk about that, actually. The, the, yeah. the whole lighting aspect of all this it is just a frees up. It frees up your ability, but it, it does take a little longer because you're manually focusing each 
shot, you're also manually adjusting each shot. Yeah. And when I tell people how to speed up their workflow, it really boils down to seconds on top of seconds, uh, anywhere from taking a little less time to bring your photos into Photoshop, two, three, 10, 20 seconds less per Im per set of images yeah. is gonna save up a lot of time over a year. It's gonna save so what, hours what what are you what's the, what's the average time that you spend on on shooting a property? I'm not a fast guy. I have worked it down to right about an hour to an hour and a half to shoot anywhere up to about 3500 4000 square feet. It takes me about uh, I can really rip through a great if I shoot really well I edit faster. Uh, that's where it helps a lot of people getting into this. They start and going, using lights and doing all this. It's just taking too long. Well, don't look at it that way. Look at it as you're going to get faster, the better you get. It takes me maybe 20 minutes if I'm zooming along and really shooting on the top of my game for real estate. If I'm uh, just doing a normal shoot, it's going to take me about 40 minutes to 50 minutes to edit one shoot and uh, that is full every shot going into photoshop masking blending layers uh and uh so it's, it takes time uh architectural though will take uh, i mean will take sometimes an hour per image uh, maybe more um because you're consulting you're dealing with props you're dealing with uh, the designer we're doing tethering and looking at stuff and micromanaging things but it will take me an hour it will take me four or five hours to do five six shots max um, and then it will take me uh, two, three, four, six, eight hours to edit, depending on the degree of the importance of the shoot or the degree of difficulty. Yeah. And by the way, while you're talking, I'm showing some of your images over on richbaum.com. And uh, we'll, we'll link to those in the, uh, in the description for this YouTube video, as well as the blog post on thisweekinphoto.com. And one thing, one thing about the sure. tilt shift, though, is once you start identifying the look of a tilt shift, you'll realize the majority of, of photographers use tilt shifts in the upper end photography. It's just the look you can see and then go, that was a tilt shift. You just know it. It's one of those things that separates the, oh, that's somebody that just took a snapshot to you know, between it, it separates the professionals from the amateurs or people that don't necessarily know their way around this type of photography, right? You don't know, you're, you don't know what you don't know. And, and you, I wouldn't suggest buying one. I'd rent one until you really realize why you need a tilt shift because it, it's pretty expensive. No, no, absolutely. So the, the other question on my list here to, to run by you was uh, clients. And I actually added another one while we were talking. So, um, uh, I want to go into lighting a little bit, uh, but clients themselves. So how do you get in, in this particular genre of photography? How do you get clients? Like, do you just go to real estate agents and go knock on doors? Do you send a get a list from your area and, and, and blast emails out and say, hey, I'm available? Yeah. How do you get people to hire you to do this kind of photography? I was hoping you could tell me. <laughs> you you do this week in photo and tell them. <laughs> Really, really, I got to just say, though, it's when people ask me, um, you know, what is the pricing? What is this? What is that? It's it's really hard for me to answer because every every um, every market differs. It depends where you live. It's, it's just so many things it depends upon how how good is your photography. It depends upon uh, what you offer. Um, you can go when you're starting out, though, the best thing to do is you got to get a resume. You've got to get a portfolio. So you can't get a portfolio until you have experience and you can't get experience until you have a portfolio. It's one of those cash 22s. But what I'd suggest is just go start shooting. You have a friend that's got a beautiful house. Ask him if you can come in and photograph their living room. You're, only, you're going to get a, a product. You're not going to get money, but you're going to get a product and you're going to get experience. Mm -hmm. Then you go over and you see a housing development, new housing development coming up down your street. Go in there, just knock on a door with a business card or a little four by five card and say, hey, I am a local photographer and I want to uh, shoot your house and, and offer to shoot it for free. Now, a lot of people are down on shooting for free. I personally am not. I think it's a great way to get experience, great way to get your word out there. One thing that's really tough, though, is if you uh, meet an agent, go, listen, I'll do you a free shoot or I'll do you a shoot at this price to, you know, to uh, instigate it. Uh, it's really difficult. It can be very difficult to raise your prices when you, you, you've got your client. Sure. Now they want 20 uh, apartment complexes shot. It's very difficult to raise your price. So you've got yeah. to really think about that. Um, it's going to take you some time, you know. Um, you can also call up uh, all kinds of, of real estate associations. You can become a member of a real estate association. You can opt in for, I've done speaking engagements 
for real estate. I've done it for design associations, for new home building associations. Personally, I have gotten very, very little return on my, on my investment in the time and effort it took to go do a presentation, but I know this works great for other people. So I'm not saying in any way not to do it. Just be aware uh, that it may not be the answer, but it may be one answer for you. You yeah. can contact, uh, oh, there's magazines like Luxury Home, Luxury Home Magazine, uh, which is based here in Sacramento, El Dorado Hills. I met them years ago and they liked my work and they wanted better work from their photographers because everybody was doing really terrible HDR, which is a common issue in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the clown pictures, the can yeah, the, the 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 oversaturated look, right? The yeah, overdone, we call it overbaked or overcooked. But mm -hmm. it's just uh, you know the important part about this whole thing is you've got to do proper colors. That's another reason why real estate is different than architectural or design. Design, you have to have the the color palette exactly you can't have any color pollution from your natural light sources you have to overpower and you have to take care of all of that real estate you can get by, by with a little less because yeah. it's a little lower lower end so it's just uh it's really just to get creative you can get online i would recommend if you're contacting contacted by a business that wants to hire you you go to the website, see, are they used to professional photography? You can always tell that. And then you may want to bid a little higher. If they're not, if they're a mom and pop shop, do it less. Is this something that interests you? Do you really want to photograph it? You you may want to put that into your pricing. So you yeah. know, it's really difficult for as far as getting clients, but uh, there's just zillions of ways to do it. And get out there, get get gregarious, get yeah. out there, say, hey, I'm Rich Baum, I'm, I'm, I'm new, I want to start photographing real estate and architecture, uh, I want to do your home, you might get in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Uh, or no, drive that's... down the street, you'll see for sale signs, call up the agent, cold yeah. call them, see, yeah. you know, they may not, uh, you know, maybe one out of every 20 person, people might give you a job. So. Yeah. And if you, if you like in the beginning, just like anything else, like just shooting models, for example, exactly. you know, you do it for free to build model up your mayhem. model mayhem or, or one model place or any of these places or agencies, yeah. you work with models to build up your portfolio. No one needs to know that no money exchanged yeah. hands. You just, you now you have a list of people that wanted your work, right? And yeah, probably the same for real estate photography, right? What about what about make aerial sure, make stuff? Make sure that all your verticals are straight. Make sure you've learned a little bit about the sure. rules. Yeah. Unlike wedding, and like almost any other genre, there are more rules to this type of photography than any other. There's much less room for creative interpretation. It's really cut and dry. It ain't like a wedding where I will shoot one this way, one this way, and one this way. Uh, it's always straight on. It's it's yeah, I hear you. It's it less if if there's a a sliding scale with with just you know get it's photo documentation versus artistic interpretation you're going to skew to this side right where it's it's more photo documentation so what Rich, what about aerial so i've got a i've got a drone back here behind me you know, you don't know if you can see it back there but are you uh, are you getting into that genre at all where you're doing aerials of these properties well i was in the aerials for years i i started uh, 6 years ago with a p1 uh, phantom pro phantom 1 and mm -hmm. uh, by dji and um, I used to shoot my own aerials, but now I don't shoot my own aerials. I usually sub it out just because I don't want the uh, liability of the hassle. But I suggest if you want to do it, there is a definite income resource, uh, income source. Uh, and a drone is a great return on investment because they're literally now the, the new Mavic Air is, is, I think, $700. And the Mavic Pro is coming out, they say, with a one-inch sensor, which is going to probably be about 1000 yeah. bucks. So they're great, really great tools. You do have to have a um, uh, operator certificate, 107. Uh, I don't know if it's called a certificate or an exemption now, but it's very easy to get. Yeah, I think it's online, right? Test. Yeah, you just, it's it's all online. You can get the whole no, thing no, online, you right? got it. You can learn online, but I think you've got to go down to testing centers. Uh, oh, um, you're talking about, yeah. yeah. So if I think I think what I'm getting confused with is if it's a just an operator's license and you're just a, you're just a hobbyist, you can register it and fly wherever you want. But if you want to charge money, then you got to do Correct. what you're talking about about right yeah. Yeah. and I, I am by no means advocating any part of drones uh, i would say if you do it though 
take it with reverence because I've, I've had a few flyaways over the years. And, oh, really? And they're, not, wow. they're not perfect. Um, yeah. And it, it can be a very, uh, you know, very tricky. So uh, just don't go out there and, and fly one. If you're going to do, if you're going to charge any money at all, be sure that you go get you your know what you're doing. seven. And I would, it's just the right thing to do. I would be worried, honestly, looking at some of those photos that were on your website, flying over these million dollar homes or multi-million dollar homes yep. with my thousand dollar drone and crashing into their, <laughs> crashing well, we into their house that they're trying to sell, right? I mean, yeah, you'd have li liability insurance, but if you're tr someone's trying to sell this house and you damage it because it's you're the, it's not not, not a good scene, not a good scene. But really important, uh, just remember too that your your regular liability insurance probably more than likely will not cover your drone and it's something that there are different formulas on you can do it per flight per whatever but you really got to take that i don't want to get into drones but you really just do it be smart and that's why i hire somebody out because i just don't want to deal with it um for there but i do yeah. use a thing called a, a painter's pole a 16 foot pole so mm -hmm. i get elevated photography which oh, really cool. helps in many situations and is is actually the right tool for the job for me in many situations. Love it, love it. Okay, so the the last question that I wanna ask you is is about lighting. I kinda, I mentioned that before, and that's the, the you know, how do you light these things? I mean, yeah, obviously you're, you're lighting a giant building. You're not gonna go out at, at night, I would assume, maybe twilight, you're a twilight photographer, right? So can you, can, can you take me through that process? Because I know a lot of, I speak to some real estate photographers and they do the whole painting with light thing where they're popping a flash on the diff individual bushes and then they'll, they'll light the interior to get that nice glow through the windows and then they'll do another exposure for the exterior and then bring all these into Photoshop and meticulously blend them in together not hdr but manually masking and yeah. bringing in different selective. elements selective. selective yeah so what, what's your process well i've i've got into teaching um uh lighting and real estate photography in general but i, I really emphasize lighting and the main thing with lighting is uh i used to do hdr i used to actually uh, with your buddy tim engel we did a hdr workshops and and we're teaching people uh, not real estate but just uh, more fine art um and I started doing the real estate and I started doing the HDR uh, with photomatics, but I found that I couldn't control the lights and it was too hard for me to try and fix colors and fix things. Mm -hmm. uh, HDR is very difficult to do really, really well. So there are only, only a few people I know that really do it in a great, great way. Mm -hmm. So I learned to use lighting and the bottom line is you basically want to overpower your ambient. So you are controlling the light. You want to be in control of everything. But the way I tend to teach it is um, I have ambient exposures. I'll do a bracket of ambient. So I have the ambient I want to use. I will do a flash image or two to give it the sharpness, the crispness. It's what I want. And then I might do a thing called a window pull or something, something we do is called window pull in darken mode. And uh, I have YouTube videos for all of these. And I have a great following. I've got over 10,000 subscribers now. And people, it's a very uh, specific genre, but these people are extremely passionate. And everybody is grasping at how to learn this stuff. So we take lights and now we're, we've gotten away from single speed lights. We're kind of all moving into the larger lights uh, from the company Godox, which is actually the same as Flashpoint, which is the same as Cheetah, Niwer. They're all Chinese lights that are rebranded, but I use Flashpoint from Adorama. Mm -hmm. I use the speed lights. I, you don't need TTL. We don't do TTL in this, so that's one nice thing. Yeah. Uh, but you can use what you what you have. But we do all off-camera lighting, and I generally use a speed light. I will use an AD200 or an Evolve 200, which is 200 watt seconds, and it's about this big, all self-contained too. Wow. All wire inner inner the wireless is interlaced in the in the light so it's all together it's really great we don't need to plug in anymore we don't need external triggers or extra i mean external receivers oh, so i use killer. a 200 i use a 300 and 360 or i use a 600 i have like two or three of each of these and it depends what i need most of the time all we're doing we don't use modification we're generally pointing it straight up off the ceiling then i am using all these images to bring it into Lightroom to fix as I want and then bring them into Photoshop to mask in the attributes of each shot. I will use the flash shot and then mask in the attributes of the ambient to bring back the shadows, bring back the the 
uh, life back to, into the photo, which might look too flashy. This actually helps me because it is much faster than if I was just using lighting in camera to get it all right. The yeah. ambient, being able to do this Photoshop work really helps. And as far as doing twilights, all my twilights are really, almost all my twilights are all ambient, single exposures with the sky replacement. I um, Once you learn to do a sky replacement, you don't have to worry about the sky not looking perfect for your shoot. You just put in a sky. Then I also, uh, there is what you could do is the light painting, as you had mentioned. A lot of people uh, do the, uh, it's been associated with the Mike Kelly effect, which here, he's a great photographer doing pops of light. You can do up to 30, 60, 100, uh, 100 layers. I love Each that. layer you're going to mask in. So as you can see, it gets quite time consuming. Yeah. But using the lights as opposed to just masking an ambient, uh, will give a better better look, but it takes much more uh, time and expertise to do. So yeah. I found it better in my life. I used to do light painting, but it just it didn't make a big enough difference for me. Yeah. So I just do. It's an, it, it's, it, it, it all it all depends on what the individual photographer is comfortable doing and what they want to do and, and what all that. the client what the project dictates and what the project dictates. Yeah, and I'm I'm pulling up your uh, your your YouTube site um your youtube channel right now tell me tell me a little bit about this what's on your youtube channel and what what can people can expect if they go over there and by the way i just you were just talking i pulled i just went and googled rich baum youtube and boom it came up as the there first you. result yeah well i i i love teaching i love telling people and, and showing them how to do things and making their life better that was really the bottom of the line when i started getting emails from around the world people telling me uh, the darken mode, it, it changed my life. And I take that with a grain of salt, but they literally said it cut hours off of my workflow, shooting and editing. And it gave me more time. My tagline is always shoot better, shoot faster, get more money and spend more time with your family, do what you want to do. So um, my YouTube channel started out about two years ago and I started just doing like screen captures and showing people editing tips. And then I started going into actually going out and doing a little bit of filming um, on location, which is hard for me because I haven't gotten into having a specific cameraman uh, with me, but I will be doing that later on in this year. So the YouTube channel just started. It took off, got legs, and I've just got hundreds and hundreds of people that really go through all the videos. And I think I've found a really good way of just explaining things in a really fundamentally and rudimentary way that people can grasp and connect and, and really work because there are a zillion YouTube uh, videos out there for everything you want to learn. But you can't, it's, sometimes it's hard to learn from them. So I, I pride myself on get, having feedback from people that, that really help them. And it's able to use it in the day-to-day -day world of, of whatever you're doing. So yeah, yeah. that worked really well. And that turned into um, a uh, workshop series that I'm doing. And uh, I hope we'll have information on that in the show notes. But yeah. I uh, do uh, two-day real estate photography workshops hands-on, which is all based around my YouTube channel. By the way, the YouTube channel is free. I do this as a gift. Um, you know, I, I just, I love doing it and it helped me launch my other platforms. Sure. So I've got the workshops. I'm doing Auburn next week, Auburn, California. Next week, I'll be in Seattle on the uh, 9th, 10th, and 12th and 13th of April. And I will be doing Dallas on the, I think the 7th and 8th of May. So that's my workshop tour and it's going along great. And people are just getting back to me just with such great, uh, feedbacks, you know, going, you really helped me and my business is showing it and it, it really transfers into, uh, working really well for people. So now is yeah. it, is the, are the workshops designed to be a, uh, you know, kind of a one-stop shop. I, I go in as a photographer, you know, so you, I'm, I'm assuming you assume a certain level of photography knowledge, right? So I go in as a photographer and then I emerge at the other end of the, the Rich Baum tunnel as I'm ready to start charging for real estate photography. Is it? Is it <laughs> it's not that. Disclaimer. Okay. Most of the people that come to the workshops are not top photographers because they will maybe go to another workshop. My workshops are geared for people, but not geared for people that are just starting 
Hopefully they've had a little bit of experience with real estate. They've done HDR and that they've had a little bit of experience with the lighting. I require everyone to have at least one off camera light and know how it works and to use it. I then take you by the hand and I will help you. And my workshops are limited to 10 people. So they're very small and intimate. Two days of shooting and editing. And um, I will show you what to do with those lights and how to edit them with the lights. But then you go off on your own. But it really is a great kick in the rear to get you going and committing to using lights and really committing to this whole thing. And uh, the, the, the feedback has just been tremendous and people are just doing really well uh, off the workshops. I love so, that. I love that. And the, the last thing I want to more. The last thing I want to talk about is your you have a podcast yeah, as well, right? Yeah. So welcome to the uh, podcasting worry, I'm not, world. I'm not giving you a run for your no, not at all. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, are, there's room in the water for everyone. It's a big pool, so come on. <laughs> so what, tell me about the podcast. What's the what? What do you cover? Is it is it similar to the YouTube yeah. channel, or do you you do go in a different direction there? Well, it was it, no, it's all real estate. Although no, it's not real estate. It's it's called Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. But that second part might change eventually to uh, architectural. But it's just shooting spaces, and um, we came up with that with a guy in New York. His name's Brian Berkowitz, and Brian's a photographer. He's a really top photographer in the. Uh, he lives in Long Island, but he he shoots in Manhattan. And he contacted me to be an interviewee, interviewee, and we started talking and we decided, hey, let's do an East Coast, West Coast podcast for real estate photography. And the great thing was, is there used to be a, a real estate photography podcast for years that went down a few years ago. So there was no options for anybody to do uh, to. We like to listen to it while we're either shooting or driving to and from a shoot. Right. So um, it is a really great opportunity. And we talk about. Uh, tips and tricks. We talk about, uh, we, we interview the best in the business. We've had s people for, that are the top in uh, search engine SEO, search engine optimization. We've interviewed the top of the photographers. We've interviewed uh, Larry Lorman, who started photography for real estate. And uh, we're doing um, just great ideas of people that are really influential in, in helping people to see things differently. And uh, it is all somewhat related, though, to um, shooting buildings, shooting interiors, real estate or architecture. So we've uh, got about nine, I think, podcasts out there. We're doing some. We even have a feature where you can record a question on our website, shootingspacespodcast.com. And you can go there, record your question, and we will answer it on the air. So really, really, uh, cool. really excited about that uh, whole podcasting thing. And it may go on to an online store and we don't know where it's going, but it sure is fun. And it is really w wonderful because we love helping people. Yeah, I got. I have you. I have the uh, the page up right now for shooting spaces, and looks like you got what about ten episodes in there, and it, we released it, one today. Yeah. Yeah, and you know you you got a lot of five star reviews going on in there. So yeah, congratulations, man. Yeah, That's for fantastic. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are those all you? You're reviewing. <laughs> We're not we're not above uh, a bribery. Okay. There you go. There you go. Well, cool, man. So we, we covered a lot in this interview. We talked to I think, you know, if, if anyone was interested in sort of wetting their appetite with this kind of photography, I think this interview at least it pointed you in the right direction and kind of dispelled some rumors about how you shoot it, what you shoot, pricing, finding clients, the gear, all that stuff. And there's other resources that you provide for people to go to continue their knowledge, yeah. right? So you've got a you've got free Facebook resources, groups, just a Facebook just group. You've a got Google a you've got a podcast. Facebook search uh, real estate photography, yeah. right? You've got a podcast. You've got the YouTube channel. You've got all this stuff for for people to uh, to kind of jump in with both feet and learn more. And if they want to take it to the next level and interact with you, they can just sign up for one of your workshops and and go directly to the source and yeah. tap into your brain directly so if if people were to go to one place after this interview and you know to to continue learning more from you where would you suggest they go i always tell people the best resource that's been around the longest is called the uh, photography for real estate dot net uh blog from larry lorman and that's been around forever just a tremendous resource the other one would be the Flickr group where you can uh, post your photos or just look at people's photos because every photo has to have a description of lighting and any other pertinent information so pfre or, or photography for real estate on Flickr or the blog 
And then uh, YouTube, I mean, I'm sorry, um, uh, Facebook, just put in real estate photography and you will find, I have several groups. One's real estate photography with lights, twilight photography for real estate, straight out of camera for real estate. There's just another group for real estate photography. So yeah. a ton of great stuff. But where where should I, they go to, to for the first step? If they're going to watch this and they're done and they just want to continue to take the next step with you, where should they go? Go to just, you could, easiest is way is to Google Rich Bomb. You can find tons of stuff there now, uh, but you could put Rich Bomb YouTube and find my YouTube channel. And then uh, you can also go into Facebook and uh, type in real estate photography and join one of the groups or many groups. And uh, again, uh, photography for real estate uh, dot net. Uh, the blog for Larry with Larry just has tons of stuff. And uh, he they've got that Flickr group too. So it's, it's just so many great opportunities nowadays where yeah. in the old days there wasn't yeah rich Baum, thank you so much for taking the time on this rainy sacramento morning to uh to chat with us and fill our our, our minds with real estate dreams <laughs> and have a great day man thanks a lot i i thank you so much frederick and uh, i look forward to your fu your future podcast because they always inspire me and i'm just pleased thank you so much for having me yeah um, welcome. on your show you're welcome. Take care, man. Bye. This is Twitter.